Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from beautiful downtown Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga po- podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Sleep In Sunday, and welcome to Interview Day. Today, we have a special day for Interview Day, because we, you know, what's going on here? If you're not in the loop, Youth of Today is playing some shows. We play this very, very wonderful festival. I didn't think it was going to be that wonderful, but it was quite a wonderful festival what? called Punk Rock Bowling in Las Vegas, where like thousands and thousands of punks take over hotels in downtown Las Vegas, and they map out this whole area that is exclusively the Punk Rock Bowling Festival. And it's quite fun, actually. <laughs> it's like the closest thing I got to a high school reunion. <laughs> Seeing these people. And did um, you bowl? Did I bowl? No, I didn't bowl, Kostuba. How's your internet doing there? We're watching it in bowl. Um, but uh, anyway, we have a special guest today, Parmananda Prabhu, sitting by my side, if you're watching live. And Sammy, what we do, we don't, we don't do this live. Usually uh, we got about, you know, 80 to 100 people live, but then most of the people, it goes out on podcasts, so they can't see you except for these people here. And please welcome Sam Siegel, our drummer extraordinaire. If you are into hardcore music, this guy's probably been on a poster on your wall because he was in a lot of famous bands, Judge, Youth of Today, Shelter, um, Side by Side, Grill Biscuits. He's been in practically every band you can think of in New York City. Um, he was even in Limp Biscuits for their first stint. The Singular, Biscuits. just one biscuit. It's not biscuits. Well, what you, <laughs> oh, you're saying you were in it for such a short time, it's Limp Biscuit? No, or the Shelter. name of the band is just Biscuit. It's not Biscuits. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was Limp Biscuits. That's Gorilla Biscuits. That's a different band. Uh, Gorilla Biscuits. Gorilla that's, Limp that's Biscuits. Plural. It's going to be in my book, From Biscuit to Biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, you know, this is an interesting day today because, uh, you know, uh, the, the formation of uh, the band. Anyway, before we start, do we have any announcements, Mayor? I got a question, Rogan. I, th- I thought we should Mayor. be working this out on air. But... um. Are we? What's the deal tomorrow? Are we on at the regular time? I can't imagine we are. Can you hear me right now? I think it's Stu's. It's because Stu's internet's. Gonna be... It's yours, Rago. I'm at it's home. Is it your internet answer. bad or is mine, Mara? Be on the speaking for him. You can be on the regular time, probably. We're we're still here. We're in Vegas. Then it should the regular be time is five a.m. New, New York time. Yeah. It appears Ragnarok can't hear me, so maybe Mary. He's not. He's out. nocturnal, you know. So he, you know, he, you know him. He doesn't sleep, so I could speak for him and say, "All right, yes, he'll be there." <laughs> Did we lose him? Yeah, I'm back now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're just yeah. trying to figure out when. When are we going to do the show tomorrow? And if so, when? Tomorrow's what day? Monday. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you. I thought we were not doing it. Okay, you just tell me. You know, we have a one a.m. show. Which is yeah. already four a.m. your time. So it's an hour later. You could do it. Yeah, I expect more from you, Raghunath. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, what are you gonna do? Sleep? Come on. 
<laughs> Here's the only issue: um, if the show goes late, I mean, the show's not going to be. Uh, no, only- no, I'm just kidding. Let's. Uh, we won't do it tomorrow. Okay. All right, and we'll figure out the rest. We might and not a little backstory Tuesday here either. too for everyone out there is that we played a concert last night. It's five o'clock in the morning now. We played. Well, it wasn't that late. We played about eight thirty p.m. nine o'clock last night. But you know, um, there's taking down and hanging out and seeing the other band that where you saw the Circle Jerks last night. And, and it's Vegas. And it's what Vegas. Say. Whatever that means, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so I I didn't get that much sleep. I don't think part. Okay, I, I so we've settled. We're we're not going to do it tomorrow. We got it. No, we're no, just we, talking. We, now, we just, now we're complaining about this morning, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> we've already moved on. Okay, Let's live in the moment, guys. Okay, this <laughs> is right. wisdom of the sages. That's right. We need Sammy. We need you on more often. I need a little help over here with this. Guy. Quite wise. <laughs> yeah. you, know what, you know what this the benefit of Sammy is. Sa- yeah. Sa- uh, one of the many benefits actually is Sammy is very, very upbeat and very, very positive. I get that. So whenever I get down on it, like, what the hell am I doing? I'm 55 well, years old. Well, it's interesting. Just, just to called- jump in for a second, <laughs> you know, when we started, and I know what you're getting at because hardcore and not hardcore, there are lines in our world, but you're playing Break Down the Walls and you're saying who's hardcore and who's not hardcore. The reality is, is, you know, I think that's an interesting angle of like, what is hardcore? And, and you know, I don't really. Yes, there's those lines, but in reality, like, aren't we all kind of hardcore in a way? You know, you're sort of either like uh, yeah. <laughs> a deep thinker and into, you know, alternative lifestyle, alternative music, whatever it may be. I and mean, that's always what attract originally what attracted me to it. I mean, I was into reggae. I was into punk. I was into hardcore. I was into hip hop. It was just in the 80s, late 80s or for me, uh, 86, 87. It was just like it was all kind of reggae at that time was um uh, you know, it was like rebel music, reggae, hip hop, hardcore. Yeah, the mainstream at all. Uh, different kinds of eating, different kinds of thinking, different kinds of, of, you know, just approaching life, dressing. And so it was kind of, um, it all kind of blended. And then as time went on, it kind of got real divided. All right, well, we're youth crew hardcore, or you're this, or, you know, you're a punk, you're a skinhead, you're this or that. But for the most part, like, you know, it all kind of, those walls are, are should be broken down or, or kind of, that's when hardcore was at its coolest, right? That's what, you know? Yeah, it was. We should, that, that, I think that's what that song was about, right? We just, uh, our, our famous song, Break Down the Walls, was, you know, truthfully, the more I sing these lyrics of you today, the more I realize this is all the most Christian, account, this was the most Christian account <laughs> band I ever did. Break Down the Walls is everything I say about, we have to draw these circles around us even bigger and bigger and bigger. And that What's label, the first verse? Tell, you know, say the first verse. It's amazing. I used to think that labels were just symbols of pride. But over time, I see they only serve to divide. What's next? It's so, it's so easy. easy. It's so easy to judge people by the way they seem to be. But we must overcome these. What is it? We Jesus. must overcome these conflicts to live life peacefully. Yeah. Okay. I wrote that was 17. Not bad, Rogo. Not no, bad. 19. The part of his generation. But yeah, I this is the idea. I think it'd be t- this is the whole essence of bhakti. Ah, St- Sammy, you're seeing that you're seeing this spirit, the spiritual. You're seeing the the, the spiritual uh, spirituality behind all the youth today songs. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. You f- I think you might have frozen me a little bit on, on the youth today show. Okay, Rogo, you with us? <laughs> okay, I think Sam this I think is like, we just it's like being Rogan. asked on like the Tonight Show and Johnny Carson kind of like I know. has a heart attack and disappears. And I'm I was supposed to be Ed McMahon today. It was going to be his interview, but seeing that he just disappeared, maybe I can get it started. And maybe it's maybe it's even better that uh, he's not here right now because what I think what everybody's wondering was what was it like to watch this guy become a Hare Krishna right in the middle of your successful band? <laughs> you yeah, I mean, so just a little backstory. You know, I grew up yeah. in New York City and uh, I started playing drums really young. My dad played drums. My grandfather played drums. So I started when I was, you know, six, seven, eight. I'm playing drums and I'm not. My sister got me in a band and I'm in a band and I'm like, this is so cool. I'm like 10, 11, 12. And then I kind of stumbled upon these hardcore kids that had a band called Side by Side. And they needed a drummer, or first it was Gorilla Biscuits for a little bit, and then side by side. But then we started playing concerts and in this hardcore scene, and we would open for Youth of Today, which was Raghunath's band. So mm-hmm. we would do these road trips, and I was such a huge fan of Youth of Today. It was like my favorite band. My friends and I would 
you know, at age 11 or 12, would like listen to it and like mosh in our room. And, you know, I was just so into it. And if you ever see the pictures on these records, they're like, these guys are like superheroes. They're huge. I mean, uh, and it was just all so exciting. And I was such a fan. I was in this, you know, I was like, next thing you know, I'm like sharing a van with them, doing a road trip, going to Buffalo for the weekend or DC or, you know, whatever it was. You were like 15 um, at that time? I was, uh, honestly, when I was in Side by Side, I was about 12, 12 and 13 years old. And, wow. you know, they were all straight edge, no drugs, no drinking. My my parents knew them really well. Purcell was sort of, well, actually, this was before Purcell and I got tight. But, um, but yeah, it just kind of happened very naturally. I'm looking back as a parent myself now, it just seems so crazy. But it, it just seemed very right at the time. Yeah. But long story short is, um, you know, next thing you know, their drummer left for, you know, a couple of different reasons. And they needed a drummer. And I got the gig as drummer for Youth of Today. And it was like sort of a dream come true because you know, it was my favorite band. So I'm sort of in my favorite band with these guys that I kind of looked up to. And it's just like, this is amazing. Cause they'd started in maybe 86, 87, 85, 86, 87. And I joined in like uh, the end of 87. So to be in one of my favorite bands, right. As a hardcore straight edge kid. Um, and then, you know, Purcell is kind of like my big brother and this is amazing. And we're touring. We flew to California for like this week, this one week thing. And we played with, you know, uniform choice in seven seconds. Then in the summer of 88, we toured the U S and little by little, I start to see the singer of my favorite band. You know, he's got a Sika. Um, <laughs> he's going. driving the van. And instead of telling me stories and talking to me, he's just looking kind of out the window in a bit of a daze chanting. And, um, <laughs> and instead of staying with all of us at the friend, you know, we, we'd stay at people's houses. So we'd all like, after okay. the show, we're going to this guy's house, we're going to get food. We're going to hang out. We're going to talk. It's going to be great. He's not staying with us. He's staying at this Hare Krishna temple with these like devotees that show up in dhotis. And, um, you know, so it was like, I felt kind of, uh, I think we all sort of felt threatened by it a little bit. Like you're taking our friend away from us. And right. our friend is kind of, um, you know, departing. And, he's changing. Uh, he's changing. And, you know, as adults now, you look back and say, oh, man, that's so important. And even Raghunath has told us now, he said, look, you know, I really wish that I, he, you know, he himself sort of put up these walls like, I have to do this. You can't come. This is me. You know, I have to do this. And I think he sort of, in retrospect, wishes that, um, you know, he kind of, uh, in, it's okay. We can all do this together. You know, you can be this. I can be that. You want to be, uh, you know, whatever it may be to each his own. Um, but at the time, there were some real, it was dramatic, you know, yeah. he's leaving, he's going, and then it basically turned into he's breaking up the band because he is a devotee and he wants to start this band called Shelter, which is a Krishna conscious band. And well, it's going to be all it, devotees. Hold, you're not a devotee, hold it one so second. Hold it, hold it one second. That was a beautiful, accurate description. Um, yeah. Before we get into that, let's, let's hear uh, Parmananda's. Parmanand, who's now a card carrying Harry Krishna, but wasn't at the time, he was also sort of freaked out, I think, or I don't know, actually, so I'd like to get to the bottom of Parmanand. It was, it was like, I love the way Sammy said, you know, the Harry Krishnas are taking away our, our singer. Well, 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 one thing that I have to mention is having Sam, having Sammy in the band, it was like the ultimate gimmick. We're youth of today and we had a 15 so year old drummer. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was kind of, it, it, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely strange. We always knew about Krishna consciousness through this band called the Chromags. I don't know if any, you know, probably half of you have never heard of a, the Chromags before, but they were this notorious street gang turned the most brutal hardcore band that you've ever heard, the most powerful music. Um, and they were all into Krishna. And so somehow or other, we had always kind of, you know, satellited around it and knew about it. And we also used to always wear Tulsi beads. Even, even when I was like 18, 17 years old, we saw the Chromax wearing it. We thought, we thought those beads were really cool. Um, as a matter of fact, when, when me and Raghunath moved to um, New York City, we had, a, we had a picture of Prabhupada taped to our phone. <laughs> Did we? Yeah. I don't remember that. We had an agnostic front sticker that we, that we, um, cut up that said agnostic phone. And then we also had a picture of Prabhupada taped to the phone. So, and it, but it was only, it was only at a jest almost. Yeah, it was kind of at a jest, not really. We didn't like, we didn't was, respect I, it. It wasn't I mean, mocking, but it was, it wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't quite mocking, but it was just sort of like, 
this is so crazy. Like the Harry Krishnas. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So, but it sort of, be, yeah. It, I think it was almost like we thought it was cool. <laughs> I think we yeah. thought it was cool and just peculiar. And yeah. just like we thought Ignacy Front was cool and peculiar. You know what I mean? All right. Continue on, my friends. Um, you know, so Krishna was just another one of those kind of colorful uh, additions, add-ons to the, yeah. to the hardcore scene, to New York City in general. You know, because we all grew up in the suburbs. Sammy did, and Sammy's a hardened New York City street kid. <laughs> <laughs> Not a street kid, but he did grow up in Manhattan. Uh, you know, but we all grew up in the suburbs where everything is just very black and white. Everything's very vanilla. Then you move to New York City, it's all these new people, and the Hare Krishnas are part of that kind of colorful fabric. So we we are we always had kind of knew about it, which was which was sort of strange. All right, so go on with uh, then. Okay, it, we you knew me, me and Parman and I knew each other since we were about fifteen, uh, just from going to shows in in Connecticut. We became good friends. He joined my first band, Violent Children. Then he joined Youth of Today. We watched Youth of Today get bigger together. We got Sammy in the band. I'm giving the timeline now. And then all of a sudden, I start getting influenced by Krishna, taking it damn seriously. And um, and you got to understand, this is like, we've been in a band. We've been working hard on this band. This band is now at its peak of, of popularity. And so and when you saw me like get into Krishna, uh, you know, was it, were you fearful? Was it cool? Was it like that last tour we did together? Um, I mean, I think in, in 1989, we went to Europe. Um, well, what happened you know, was, was here's, the chrono here's the chronology. We did our final tour. I quit. I went to India. Uh, and then I, that's when I was like, I'm over it. Goodbye. Shaved my head, got a Sika, went to India. And then I got that call. Hey, man, let's do it. Let's do a tour. Tour. Well, Shelter wasn't even in the mix yet. Uh, Shelter wasn't. Shelter was like my farewell record. Um, I wasn't planning on doing music anymore, but we ended up starting it back up. But then I did it as a brahmachari. I did that nineteen, that made that tour through Europe as a brahmachari. You know what else was an interesting little um, Krishna side note? Please tell. Um, <laughs> when we first moved to New York City. Uh, me and Raghunath got an apartment on 15th Street on the on the west side. And we had just become vegetarian, too. So, like, you know, you're an 18-year-old kid, you know, living in New York City for the first time. And then you become vegetarian. It's like, what do you eat? I probably ate at Ray's Pizza daily yeah. <laughs> you know, for the dollars. Like, we didn't know what to Sixth eat. Sixth Avenue? Yeah, Sixth Avenue. That was the um, one. So around the corner from us on Greenwich Avenue, there was a Krishna preaching center. And they used to have flyers that said free vegetarian meal with the talk. And we didn't know what to eat. So we were like, great, a free vegetarian meal. We'll go there every day. <laughs> so we used to go there quite often. And that's three where days the, a week. Right? That's where the indoctrination happens. Yeah, it was like three days a week they used to have that. And Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But, you know, here, here's what I'm wondering. it Because, it, like, when I was into hardcore straight edge wasn't like it wasn't happening in new york for sure and then as i was getting out of it you guys are just kind of starting your band and, and starting the straight edge thing and so when i look at your band it was a different thing than when i was into hardcore it was like it was like you're getting to like purity in different ways like first of all it was like uh, no drugs but then you guys like kind of like took it up one level with like vegetarianism right mm -hmm. And so that was like kind of like one one more addition to it, which is, you know, not exactly like a punk, you know, not thought of as like a punk rock thing, but now it's kind of like become an alternative idea, right? Like first straight edge was like an alternative thing. It was so on, you know, it was so against the mainstream, it actually became punk, although it's really seems like it should be a mainstream thing. And sure. then there was vegetarianism, which, you know, it's like, even then it was seen like then when people were vegetarians then it was like more out of like a health kind of thing you know and so it seems like you were also even into like physically like exercising and working out and stuff like that as a band like youth of today at least that's how i perceived it which so it which seemed like, probably the most unpunk thing to yeah do. yeah <laughs> right you're supposed to be like heroin addicted and like skinny and you know and so like you kept it was like you're up in it each step you know like getting like more pure and natural even though these are like alternative things but then you went like too far, <laughs> like and you went, you know, into like the Hari Krishna thing. It was just like, 
it 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 must I, I would imagine for someone like like um like Parmenander or Sammy would be like oh hold it no he just went over the edge though or something like that mm. yeah well you, you yeah. know um I think I think a lot of I think a lot of um the fearfulness also also was because our idea of uh, of Krishna was the Cromax who right. were you know, they were tough guys who were street guys they lived in squats and so you kind of wonder, is this a real thing? <laughs> like, yeah, is this real? <laughs> the Cro-Mags are into it. They're not, they're, you know, they're, yeah. I, don't, I think they're smoking marijuana or doing something. They're viol- violent. Yeah. So you know? We didn't know if it was a real thing or if it was just some kind of like crazy New York City, you know, people in New York City do, did crazy things back yeah, then. Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> like it didn't necessarily add to the credibility of the Harry Krishnas, we just like the Cromax. But are we going to join? A there was also, I mean, back then it was nineteen. It was the eighties that that movie Airplane. I mean, there was the the sort of Harry Krishnas, the people at the airports that give you flowers. There was that kind of thing. There was a lack of education, yeah. you know. And I, I kind of what I learned later, Ray, is that you were like, you know, also just sort of this searcher at the time. Like you were into like other religions for a little bit, right? And taking classes and, and kind of looking behind this door, looking behind that door, and looking back now the guts that it took to kind of push the envelope like Kastu was saying and to kind of say hey you know what actually we're not into here's a song about illicit sex we're not into illicit sex so we had a song called what goes around comes around um here's a song called potential friends about meeting someone i think you wrote it about meeting someone on the, on the bus so like people weren't writing those lyrics in hardcore mm. at the time um there was more basic you know unity we're gonna spread a song about that or we're gonna write a song about this but so on our album, When I'm Alone, you know, these songs were talking about other things. And I think it's not easy to push the envelope. It's imagine being in your high school and everyone's doing one thing. And here's this guy that's basically saying, you know what, actually, I'm not going to dress like that. I'm going to dress like this. Or, you know, we're going to be vegetarian or we're going to be this and that. And um, I guess, and you guys can speak to it probably better than I can, but with being a Hare Krishna, a lot of those big steps to the average person of like, hey, you have to, you can't eat meat and you can't do drugs and you can't gamble and you can't do, you know, it's not about illicit sex, it's, it's this and that. You know, as being straight edge the way we were, you're sort of partially in the door. You got a big foot in that door already. And I, I yeah. think that you probably being the searcher that you were at that age and just the kind of person that you are, you're what makes you, um, you I think you just went hard for this direction for I'm sure multiple reasons that you've probably spoke about on the show. And, uh, and that's great. And, you know, I think what just like the basic thing, what we lacked at that time was just the ability to be mature and to communicate, you know, which is just a no brainer. Like if you, in retrospect, if you say, Hey, listen, I'm into this and it's cool and you can come or not come. And the band, I could have been, I could have done it a little bit more delicately. <laughs> yeah. Blessing, we all could look, I could the the band. Day. So one kind of famous story is like Walter and I were driving, we're all on tour, we're driving somewhere in the South. We're just losing it. We're so, uh, you know, being on tour for two months and it's just a whole, like, it just takes a lot and you're young. But Raghunath had this picture of Krishna like taped to the, uh, to the, by the steering wheel. And one day we drew a mustache on it. And mind you, when we would sleep in the van, like he would draw on us. It was pranks, like level <laughs> 10 pranks. I think we put um, laxatives in, they put in my drink and it, it just went on and on, the, the jokes. And and just imagine being 15, just teenage, 16, teenage pranks. Yeah, Hi-jinks. so we drew this mustache Hi-jinks. one day and he lost in my his mind. In my defense. Oh, you, you're you the one that did that. my defense, I wouldn't draw the mustache on Krishna. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it qualified me to become a devotee. <laughs> but the pranks were level 10 from, from everybody, you know. Um, so, you know, that's just where we're at. But I, again, in retrospect, I think just um, the way I was raised, like you said, I, was, I grew up in, in Greenwich Village. And like, to me, it's all fine. You know, like if you want to be this or that or whatever, like it's great. And, um, you know, I wasn't that evolved back then, but it's just about communication and, and great, you know, like you're a hard Christian. That's awesome. I, I have a lot of respect for it. I've, I'm so thankful for being exposed to it through these guys. And, um, and it's, you know, it's a wonderful journey. And now here I am in 19, what is it? 2021. And I'm in Las Vegas. I'm going to play a show. We're playing a show together with shelter next week at a retreat up in Northern California. And it's, you know, it's a gift. It's, it's really wonderful. And it's cool being on this, you know, this show with everybody and, 
Yeah. Sammy booked the first shelter tour and played on the first shelter. He, were you on that tour, Kosiba? We did a tour with like 15 brahmacharis. I know, remember seeing eight three swamis. I remember seeing you in Boston. <laughs> I remember seeing you in Boston. And maybe no, that was that, that tour. I booked that tour from my bedroom. Another long story short, but basically it's a band called Quicksand. It's one of their first tours. Um, they had their own van. They were kind of traveling on their own. There was a band called Inside Out, which had this guy, the singer was Zach De La Rocha, who went on to sing for Rage Against the Machine. And then there was Shelter. And so, you know, I booked a tour, but I didn't really handle the logistics. It's time to leave. And a Winnebago shows up and a school bus shows up. And the school bus is filled with Hare Krishnas and the Winnebago is filled with the Maharaj. And then there was a van that had the non-devotees, which was Inside Out. It was Zach, who was like one of the funniest guys. Parmananda was not a devotee at the time, you know, myself. And it was like really fun. So we would go play these shows and we would drive. And in this van, we were telling like, we would just laugh for like the whole eight hour drive, tears in our eyes, <laughs> laughing, having so much fun. And Raghunath was kind of with the Maharaj or he was on the bus and we were pulling over and cooking food on the side of the, the, the freeway. And like, you know, there was a different thing going on over there. And basically in the morning, it would be like time to leave. And Raghunath would just kind of look at us and, you know, at whatever house we were staying at or whatever. It's like, oh, we're leaving in like, you know, 8 a.m. we're leaving or 9 a.m. we're leaving. And Parmananda, you're going to ride with the Maharaj. Or, you know, tomorrow, like, okay, oh, we're leaving now. Like, Sammy, you're going to ride with the Maharaj. He's like, I don't want to ride with the Maharaj. I want to tell <laughs> jokes with Zach from Rage Against the Machine and all my friends. <laughs> and next thing you know, I'm riding for like this five-hour drive with the Maharaj in the Winnebago. And it's like, you know, 9 in the morning. I'm just like, oh, my God, I just want to tell jokes. And the Maharaj looks at me. It's just like, so, like. What do you think the meaning of life is? I'm just like, I'm <laughs> man. I'm not in the mood. But no, it was wonderful. And we had great conversations. And um, that whole, you know, that in retrospect, that tour in itself, I mean, it was only three weeks to Minneapolis and back. But imagine just that circus on the road. It was so special. It was really cool. It was. Although you want to know what's really cool. Um, in our van, the bass player of Shelter was in our van. With, uh, with Zach and all the hardcore kids. His name was Yasso. Oh, yeah. And Yasso was like, he was like a normal guy. Like, you know, everybody else, all the other Christians were like, you know, in their robes with their Sikhs and their shaved heads and, you know, what, constantly with the bead bag in their hand. But Yasso was like, he would play basketball with us. He was normal, he had hair, he looked like a normal guy. He was a carpenter. Um, so he was sort of our first glimpse into you could be a Hare Krishna, just be a normal guy. Yeah. <laughs> and we right. loved him. He was such a he was such a funny, nice, down to earth guy who was who was also, you know, pretty devoted to to, to right. Bhakti. Yeah, you know, we back then and I I, I want to just, you know, take full responsibility and full ownership here. I was a fanatic and I demanded everyone else become fanatics like me, including Sammy. And Purcell and Parmananda and everybody else in my band. And I tried to just like set the Harry Krishna bar very high. And, if, and I fully expected everybody to jump that high. And some people were just like, no, I'm not jumping. I'm not jumping that high to this bar. <laughs> some people were like, okay, we'll jump it. And then, but, um, and it was uh, not just a high bar, but I was like at a time in my life where I was just like over the material world. And therefore, there was no black and white for me. There was no foot halfway in. I got to jump in this water. And for me to actually, and let, I just want to share also what Sam was talking about and, and, and Purcell, formerly Parman, or Parman on the formerly Purcell, we had a crew of like hundreds of people we would hang out with in New York City on the weekends. And we were all pretty good friends. And we were all pretty good guys. Like, like, like Kostuba, you were saying, the scene that you and Louie were from, we were not part of that scene in one sense. We were like a scene within a scene. Right. We didn't do drugs. We weren't like violent. We were, you know, we didn't smoke. You know, we had some like we were all vegetarian. We were clean cut. We were. And so it was almost like um, these aren't bad people. Why do you got to like why do you got to like step away from this, Ray? And um, it was still these things like I, I just felt uh I don't know. I felt like sort of God possessed almost, but because I did it in a little bit of like, for me, I needed to like make a line in the sand. And because, because of that, I think I isolated the people for that. I'm a, I'm a little sorry for, but, uh, but I'm not fully sorry because I think that's what I needed. I needed to step away from these people who 
who are actually my good friends, um, just so I could re sort of rebirth myself. And maybe some people can relate to that. Yeah. Sometimes you have to cut and walk away just so you can find a new identity uh, that was sort of let underneath what I was. Part. You know what? I felt the exact same way when I became a devotee. Mm -hmm. It was way easier for me just to kind of like, you know, I, I, I had an apartment in New York City. I worked with Civ at this health food store, you know, uh, was active in bands. And I just felt like I need a detox from all of this. I moved out of my apartment. I didn't tell anybody where I was going. Siv didn't even know where I was going. And I went and I left and um, I moved to a Krishna farm. And it was, I specifically wanted to go to the Krishna farm because it was just away from everything. Like I, I think I also needed just to cut my old life, <laughs> you know, and start a new life. Um, not everybody has to do that. And it's, it's kind of cool to see that the Bhakti movement has, has matured in a direction where you just be a normal guy and, and get into Bhakti. And there's like that avenue where, you know, if you want to get into Bhakti in the early 90s, the only avenue for you to do that was to move into a temple, shave your head, like do a, kind of an extreme life change. Yeah. But um, there was, really, uh, you know, I'm going to give props to Kastuba because Kastuba is one of the directors at the Bhakti Center which they had so much of a broader vision of what it meant to, to be into Bhakti and what Bhakti actually was. And they were one of the first people that really promoted this idea that, you know, we're going to make this easily digestible and available to everybody because, you know, uh, I think everybody's a little sick of the material world at times. Everybody's a little sick of, um, of, you know, their lower nature becoming, you know, you know, overtaking them. And so it's not just a, you know, it's a thing that everybody could relate to. And I think Kastuba and, and places like the Bhakti Center have done so much of a better job of, of making it, you know, appealing and applicable just to anybody who can walk off the street. It wasn't like that in the early 90s. <laughs> um, Vegan Schrucker writes in uh, to Sammy and Purcell, did either... Anybody in the band realize that Ray's taken off the indie and quitting the band? How did, how did that come about? I don't even remember, but Sammy? I just feel like in Europe in 89 is where it was... Uh... Oh, it was before Europe, so that breakdown well, of the wall... The, we're not on this alone tour. That's when I left after that tour. Well, we had, we had gotten the offer to tour in Europe while you were in India, while you were in Vrindavan, and we were manically trying to get in touch with you to do it for <laughs> like back then Purcell sent me he used to send me like uh do you remember air mails when you, <laughs> the paper was super thin and it folded yeah. really lightly there was no phones or uh e emails back then uh, but I got uh, I did get a few uh air mails from him you know who else I gotta I gotta I think I still might have this letter you know this is also the my the famous Michael Lago was uh interested in signing youth of today to also what? mca records or something or what he, he was the guy that signed metallica White yeah, i know who he is but so so yeah. yeah so for youth of today that would have been a big thing yeah and yeah, you were in he india brought, he brought us into our into the office were you in india i was in india i got a letter from you like it's blowing up they want us to be on <laughs> mca records i was like oh my god do i have material I was, th I actually you threw thought, it in the Yamuna. <laughs> <take> the letter. <laughs> I was actually thinking, well, um, maybe I have material desires and I'm in Vrindavan. Maybe my material desire is to be like a rock star. And now Krishna is fulfilling that desire. I was actually torn a little mm -hmm. bit because I did love music and I did love the band, but it, I knew I had to step away. But you're like, this is a test. <laughs> I just, he and he, up the and he failed it because he was like, yeah, I'll go to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's, uh, it's tough to, you know, I even see you still sort of struggle with it today, right? It's tough to, um, for sometimes for people to kind of have one foot here and one foot there and one foot there and one foot there. You know, I'm a, I'm a devotee. I'm a yoga instructor. I'm a hardcore singer that plays concerts. Like, how do you kind of come to peace with that? And for everybody, it's different. You know, some people, it's just not an issue. And other people, they have to kind of find these places in their in their mind or their spirit to like, um, to where they're going to put these kind of things or how they're going to, uh, you know, kind of express it to the public or whatever. But, 
you know, definitely, I agree. I mean, I, I, back then, especially, like, yeah, you have to kind of take, draw some, to become a devotee. Like, I, I get it now. Like, yes, you have to jump in full board, and it, you can't really do both. I mean, now it's a different time. But as far as, I don't really remember when it specifically ended. It's interesting for me being in a lot of these bands. When Judge broke up, when Side by Side broke up, when all my bands kind of broke, it just sort of happened. I don't know. It just, I mean, it was, I guess it was going down that path. For me, it was in when we when we were in Europe is when it was really becoming kind of divisive. And he was like, just staying at the temple. Like most nights we were staying in other places, squats and people's houses and this and that. And then it kind of, we played like one last show, maybe. I mean, I'm sure you guys remember Purcell probably better than I do. Like we played a big show at Fenders. And I think that might've been the last kind of we're done. I don't know if there was a conversation. I've got a photo of the two of you guys. Uh, from that Fender show and it's just like it really kind of captures a lot to me you both look very like there was kind of that pale devotee look at the time <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't really like a healthy thing the way you guys are now I think at the time it was sort of uh yeah the skinny pale kind of vibe but um <laughs> I was 22 uh well I will say that it was very difficult that tour in Europe was very difficult for me because I had lived as a brahmachari and I like being a brahmachari, but I was a little bit struggling, like, what is my identity now? And um, when I got offered to go to Europe, I was like, you know what? I've never been to Europe. I always wanted to Europe, go, go to Europe. You know, maybe I'll just do this tour. I'll just do it as a brahmachari and see what happens. And I tell you, I was struggled so much on that tour just with and, and like I said before, it's not like you guys were doing anything evil. It was just like I have these standards of a monk, and now I'm just like playing all these squats and burnout buildings and nightclubs throughout Europe every day, and uh, staying up late and had no regulation, and it just sort of cracked me. I felt like, and I couldn't, you know, when living in India, I sort of like was on my A game of my behavior, of my thoughts, of my lifestyle. And so then it, I felt like that really casted a, a, a wide difference between who I am now and what I was then. And I still wasn't even comfortable with who I was now. I still wasn't comfortable there. So I was really having like these emotional, um, uh, the, the, uh, trying to slay these emotional demons, but I felt like they were like getting the best of me as well. And then I just, just said, yeah, it's over. And I also uh, moved to the farm and detoxed um even musically it's interesting to look back um and to you know like you know how like when you're younger how life like the difference between 12 and 13 to 13 and 14 and 15 and like it's so um it's so intense those differences but but musically like you're when that first shelter record came out they had a song that had a drum machine that was almost like an industrial song that had a sample called shelter and it was really weird and really sort of scary and at the time just totally insane to even attempt to do that. But I think it's really cool that you did it. And then I don't know kind of how quickly after maybe a year or something, or I don't know how long it was, but, but pretty, not probably not that long, but you guys did this Ray and Purcell project, which had a drum machine. Um, there was still hardcore stuff, but you're, I think it's just, it's, you know, just that desire to kind of want to push the envelope and, and dig deeper and not, you know, part of being a, a punk, you know, which is sort of the, the core of hardcore, right? Like is, to not want to kind of be doing the same sort of thing and to, and to kind of be searching and the hardcore scene became very conformed where everyone bought into it, which is awesome, but you were already kind of like out the door, you aren't to the next thing. And um, I feel like there's kind of, you know, a pattern, which is not a bad pattern to have, but a pattern for you and probably for some people, you know, that you just, okay, that's great, but everyone's doing, I, I, what, I, I gotta be into something else here. And not to say that you were, becoming a Christian just to be different. You know, I'm sure there was deeper meanings for you, but, um, but it was just like knowing you now like that, you weren't going to just sit still and just be like wearing a champion hoodie and be happy with that. You know, you were going to kind of keep going and keep going. And, um, you know, for me, I was, I had my champion hoodie and my air revolutions and I was ready to, to stick to that for a minute. <laughs> I, wanted, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to stay there for a little bit longer, but, uh, it's all, you know, everyone's in different places. It's, it's it's interesting to note that 
when he said he was going to, he wasn't going to do it anymore. The band was at its absolute height. (laughs) You know, we were huge in America. We just did this three and a half month tour in Europe. We were becoming huge in Europe. It was almost seemed like the sky was the limit. We were going to take over the world with the straight edge revolution. And then he's like, I don't want to do it. (laughs) He couldn't really. He started a record label, you know, he started a record label and then he, you know, walked away from it. And then he started another record label and walked away from that and not, you know, walking away in like a bad way, but I just think it's, and again, Raghu, you could speak to it probably better, but you, he started this record label called Revelation Records. And so not only were we getting popular, but this band Girl Biscuits that was on Revelation, the label that he started was getting popular. And, you know, as was Inside Out, now was, you know, all these other Chain of Strength and all these other bands. Um, so, you know, he kind of was walked away from that. Um, Basically, but, yeah that label was assisting all these other bands to become more and more popular as well. And, you know, it's one of these things, and we talk about this on the show on a regular basis. Once you get that higher taste of Krishna, nothing is the same. Like nothing's the same anymore. Nothing will do it for you anymore. It's just like, what am I doing? And of course there's like so many middle paths out there, Um, you know, uh, but for me, it was like, and maybe because my age too, it's just like, I was just sort of like, it's over. I'm just going to, and I just, I did a 180 degree turn. And it, it wasn't until a few years later that Shelter actually started. And then Purcell got interested in Bhakti. Um, you know, a Vegan Trucker's got a couple questions. Um, uh, this first one for you, Purcell, Parmananda. Uh, what was it for you that you were like, okay, Raghu left. I left maybe three years after you. And we didn't really have much conversation so much but what was it uh what was it that convinced parmananda to become a devotee when it seemed he had no interest in it when ragu left yot to go to an ashram parmananda you want to jump in on that uh you know it was a it, it was around that time where uh i was probably like 22 years old and 22 years old is an interesting time because you're not a kid. You're still young, but you're not a kid anymore. You know what I mean? So I think it's a, I think it's one of those ages where you're just like, okay, I got to get serious about life. What's my next step? I'm an adult now. I'm not a kid. Um, so I was living in California at the time. I was actually working for that rec- that record label that Raghu started Revelation Records. And I must say, I had a pretty good material life. I barely worked. I used to, my, my job was to pick bands for the label. And I was actually <laughs> really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would go to shows, I would pick the bands, I'd make like a rapport with the bands and, you know, try to sign the bands. And a lot of the bands that I signed, the record label went on to sell them to major labels for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So um, I was good at it. I was living in California. I didn't pay rent because I lived at the record label. And I remember thinking, like, I have all my checks in the check boxes of material life, and still something is missing. Like, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Um, but I think I was influenced by by Ruggenaut just in the fact that, like, okay, I have everything checked off except there's one check box that I don't have checked off, and it's spirituality. Maybe there's actually something to this. And so I quit everything. I quit the record label and I, I just like out of the blue, nobody could figure it out. I moved back to New York, but in my mind, when I moved back to New York, it was like, I'm going to move back to New York. I'm not a kid anymore. I got to just kind of figure out life. I can't do it in California. Everything's too nice out here. I got to move back to New York and just kind of figure out what the next direction of my life is going to be because just being like the hardcore guy and it just wasn't doing it for, for me anymore. I think I wanted something way deeper. And so when I went back to New York, um, luckily I tried all different things. You know, I think probably Kostuba and Raghunath, I know Raghunath went through this, but you know, Kostuba could probably say this too. When you're getting into stuff, you get into all kinds of stuff like Buddhism and um, Taoism and you know, I, there, there was raw that foods, so. raw foods. There was, I, because Stuba probably remembers this place. It was a bookstore on Fifth Avenue called East West Books. Remember that yeah. place? Yeah. I used to go in there every day. I spent all my money <laughs> at East West Books just trying to figure out like which one of these things is going to land for me. And it just so happened that it just 
it landed for me in Krishna. Like I really felt a, a, a deep connection with that. It's not like Parmananda was calling me up. Hey, what do I do next? Like, I didn't even know he got into it. He just sort of came on his own accord. It was quite amazing. Yeah, it was quite, it was quite amazing. You know, I like to take this back a notch because for some of us, even the concept of straight edge, not doing drugs, not smoking, is like a, for, that's a huge thing for a lot of people. Um, or eat, eating meat. Like we've had a lot of people, you know, hear me on Joe Rogan and then sort of like being straight edge and get, giving up meat eating is a very massive step. It's like climbing stairs and the first five steps are missing. It's like, how am I supposed to get up there? And we don't realize how deeply woven into culture this is because, you know, we've been doing it for years. But um, let's say uh, like with uh, Sammy, what do you think about that? All I mean, you're in New York City. So you have kids in your junior high school that are into drugs. What, what was yeah, it? Yeah, it's uh, my mom said, you know, it's, a par- yeah, it's like uh, a parent's uh, dream come true to, to have your kid kind of stumble upon straight edge. Also, I want to <laughs> just, if my phone dies, I apologize. I'll try and get on my computer, but I have technical issues. It's a long story these days. But, um, but I, yeah, I mean, there was no, it, it was, for me being 14, 15 to have a crew, you know, like a gang that was all straight edge with an outfit and a, and a songs to go with it and places to express <laughs> everything this. you needed. Yeah. It was the coolest. It was so yeah. easy and so amazing. Like I, my daughter's 11. I just, you know, man, imagine she found a crew that of people that believed in those things that, you know, that we did like that would be really interesting. It would be really, you know, it'd be great. Um, and now I guess there's, a roadmap for spirituality more so than there was back then. And there are sort of, it's, there are outlets. It's, it's easier, but you're still not like if you are now in your life and you're trying to stop eating meat or trying to stop drinking or smoking or whatever it is you're doing. Um, if you're not into the hardcore scene, I guess it, it's harder. Although I guess you could go to, you know, going to yoga studios now it, it helps. Um, but yeah, at the time it was, there wasn't, it, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was way easier for me. I mean, I did it in stages. So I stopped eating red meat and I was like, I'm only going to eat white meat. I mean, chicken and turkey and fish. <laughs> and then I remember stop. I remember like six months later, I stopped eating white meat and then I was just eating fish and then I stopped eating fish. And it was about a year long process, kind of around 87, 88 for me. But, um, but then once I was there, it was fun. We had like, so we had this little like paper magazine where we went on tour in 88 that had like the one vegetarian restaurant in every city across the country. So we'd go to, you know, wherever we were in South Carolina, we'd open it up and it was like this one place. There was a seventh day Adventist place in Detroit that we would go to. Um, there was just like the one place and like the one health food store. And we, it was so much fun. Cause it was like this exploratory adventure of like, I found this thing called rice dream. It's this like rice milk, you know, ice cream. And we're like, yeah, it's great. And like, you know, so it was really a uh, fun scavenger hunt you know for for us all i think um that's a good way to put it it was so not in the conversation vegetarianism health food stuff like that in the in the 80s yeah we'd go to quantum leap on sundays we'd have the you know baby blue corn like blue corn pancakes like oh my god there's blue corn out there and like it uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was just fun you know it, it made it kind of fun and adventurous and, and proud I, you know i was like we'd wear jackets that had like straight edge and you know vegetarian on the back and all this stuff because we were proud of it. it was and uh and me being a little younger than those guys too i was just a little more of a kid thing of where like you know when you're 15 you're just like i'm into this i mean whatever yeah. whether you're whatever you're into at 15 you could be a football player or a gangbanger like whatever it is like you're into it and so i was into this you know and again yeah it ties back to when my our leader, you know, our singer of my band was, was changing and, and it was sort of crumbling, which, you know, you know, now nothing lasts forever. And, and that happens. But, uh, but I think that was all the more reason why it was so sort of like, you know, oh my, like just a, a bummer at the time, but you you make it a great point. Community makes it easier. We can't expect everybody to be trailblazers, but when there's a community already existing, Sammy just stepped, I mean, he's a child basically you know, prepubescent child or just right in puberty. And you can step in the community of people that aren't doing drugs, have songs and a culture to endorse it. It's like, it makes it easy. Um, I'm assuming and- that's what AA, I'm assuming that's what AA is. I've, you know, I've passed the meetings. It looks like fun. Everyone's hanging out. 
smoking cigarettes, chilling out. I mean, it sounds like a good time. Uh, so I'm assuming, yeah, yes. You know, to your point, community, for sure. We do have a lot of AA uh, Bhakti. We have a whole Bhakti AA group here, Sammy. Do you know yeah, that? I believe it. Yeah. You know, you, right. it helps. You know, you need friends. You need uh, support. And, and that um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Now we're working on marrying everybody off to each other. This is our next phase. Like, okay, let's take it up a notch again. Let's t- um, Hold yeah. on, you lost me. What? what? <laughs> yeah. Rogan's has his fascination with arranged marriage, and he wants to marry all our listeners together. Uh, okay. You know, I, I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I Maybe find- he's finally gone too far. <laughs> yes. I, I do find it kind of interesting that we all just kind of stumbled upon these yoga, yogic principles, you know, like in Yutha today, we were basically following all the yamas and the niyamas of the yoga sutras. You know, all of our songs were about that. You know, it was about community. You know, we're not in this alone, coming together, having other people. Um, so it's just at a very young age, we just kind of figured it out. And of course, it was just like, you know, when, when it came to bhakti, it was just so natural to get into it. because we were all You know, I, I, I uh, not that I want to say that he gets the sole credit or anything, but I do. And, and I've said this on the show before, but one of to, to this day, what fascinates one thing that fascinates me is that uh, there's this there is this bhakti tradition that is obviously, you know, goes back centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's a it's a whole different culture. It's a whole different world. It's a whole different philosophy than the world that we lived in. And that Srila Prabhupada could like convey that in such a way where guys like Harley and John not only caught on to it, but were able to express it themselves very effectively. And, and, and even so like, you know, like when I was a kid, I, I was just a kid, but you know, I was kind of sharp, you know, I had a certain IQ and I was, you know, ready to, you know, attack it and try to pick it apart and, and so on. And I and I I could watch many other people do the same thing, and I just saw that they had an answer for everything. You know, they, they, it's just like you you know every question there's like a really solid answer, and 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 that and vegetarianism was like a, a huge part of that, and uh, you know even not doing drugs, even though they were doing drugs, was a big part of that. But like all the values that you're all the values that you were picking up on, how it got into that scene. I don't know if there was another channel that was really doing, I mean, I'd imagine there must have been a few if I think about it, but like certainly the primary one was that. Somehow, you know, like somehow Prophet sitting in, you know, sitting in Vrindavan, you know, writing these books somehow like penetrated in into that world. It, it, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a testament to his ability just to communicate, you know, well. Yeah, yeah, that, it, it was quite fascinating. It was quite fascinating. You know what? That's our show, man. It's six o'clock. All right, we're, already. we're done. Um, thanks for everybody for joining us. I hope this took you down an interesting trip. For some of you, it was, a, it was like a history class. For some of you, like, what the hell just hijacked our morning Bhagavatam class? And uh, But for me, this was beautiful to hear all these different vantage points of these guys I grew up with. And uh, in, in retrospect, Sammy Parmanan, I apologize for any hell I put you through over the years with my extremism and uh, <laughs> sorry it's all good man it's good. but you know truthfully <laughs> I was walking ready. around punk rock bowling yesterday you know we had a, such a nice uh show yesterday so many people came up to me and they were just like thank you i gave up alcohol i gave up meat eating because of your band i gave up so i think there's like preliminary stages just like in the yoga system there's a yoga ladder where we're sort of like letting go of attachments and i just see uh you know the work so you, you know you're working on keith morris or what uh keith morris <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not climbing the ladder no. okay <laughs> thanks everybody thanks sammy thank you well, thank sammy you. and especially cool. waking right, up early it's, it's not thank easy you. to wake up early on sleeping sunday but we're on west coast time thank all of the californians out there if you too, if you all want to hang with us, do it this weekend at Chicken Camp, California, in Cobb, California, Northern California, flying to SFO. You can get, you can, you can do it on the rough side, and you can camp, which is cool. Or you can uh, get a little posh and get a little tiny Glamp. cabin. Go to Mundala.org. We call it glamping now. Mundala.org. Mara's going to be there. We're excited to have Mara there. That's right. Um, Bunky. 
show up to. And of course, uh, just the shelter band is playing, even though it is a, a Kirtan Yoga Festival. It seems like the worlds have all merged, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem that way? And uh, I want to thank Parman for we'll, joining us. We'll, all certainly, these we'll certainly find out when shelter plays <laughs> if they've actually merged. <laughs> yeah. But I'm looking forward to meeting more Zoomers and more others out there. Um, thanks for everybody coming out of the closet. We had a lot of people come out of the closet and say, I was hardcore. Thank you very much for sharing that. Okay. Kashanki's got her, 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 uh, her records out. Kashanki's so hardcore. Look at Kim. She's got a tattoo on her neck. You're not fooling anybody, Kim. We know you're hardcore. You can't go undercover with that neck tattoo. <laughs> 